The row between India and Canada continues, only it's starting to heat up even more. Hey y'all, welcome to my channel. I hope you're having a great day. Well, for the past year or so, the Indian press have really been roasting Justin Trudeau, and with good cause, I would say. But it's starting to heat up even more. This all comes on the heel of Commissioner Mike DeHume's announcement last week that the Indian government posed a threat to Canadians. He did this on a Thanksgiving Day press conference, which was highly unusual. And that fact was actually pointed out at the time during the question period of that press conference. Let's take a look at what the commissioner actually had to say, and then we'll talk about it. An extraordinary situation is compelling us to speak about what we have discovered in our multiple ongoing investigations into the involvement of agents of the government of India in serious criminal activity in Canada. It's not our normal process to publicly disclose information about ongoing investigation in an effort to preserve their integrity. However, we feel it is necessary to do so at this time due to the significant threat to public safety in our country. Over the past few years, and more recently, law enforcement agencies in Canada, including the RCMP, have successfully investigated and charged a significant number of individuals for their direct involvement in homicides, extortions, and other criminal acts of violence. In addition, there has been well over a dozen credible and imminent threats to life, which have led to the conduct of duty to warn by law enforcement with members of the South Asian community and specifically members of the pro-Khalistan movement. There's a violent extremist threat in Canada that Canada and India have been working on over the years. However, these threats are impacting Canada and India's ability to collaborate. Earlier this week, RCMP Deputy Commissioner of Federal Policing made attempts to meet with the Indian law enforcement counterparts to discuss violent extremists occurring in Canada and India and present evidence pertaining to agents of the government of India's involvement in serious criminal activity here in Canada. Unfortunately, these attempts were unsuccessful. Through our national task force and other investigative efforts, the RCMP has obtained evidence that demonstrates four very serious issues. One, violent extremists impacting both countries. Two, links tying agents of the government of India to homicides and violent acts. Three, the use of organized crime to create perception of unsafe environment targeting the South Asian community in Canada. And the fourth, interference in democratic processes. Investigations have revealed that Indian diplomats and consular officials based in Canada leveraged their official position to engage in clandestine activities, such as collecting information for the government of India, either directly or through their agents, and other individuals who acted voluntarily or through coercion. Evidence also shows that a wide variety of entities in Canada and abroad have been used by agents of the government of India to collect information. Some of these individuals and businesses were coerced and threatened into working with the government of India. The information collected by the government of India is then used to target members of the South Asian community. This evidence was presented directly to the government of India officials, urging their cooperation in stemming the violence and requesting our law enforcement agencies work together to address this issue. The RCMP is hoping to address these threats through our relationship with the government of India and the National Investigation Agency with the end goal of strengthening the safety and security of the Canadian public and South Asian community. The safety and security of our citizens, regardless of their background or belief, remains a top priority for the RCMP and we will not tolerate any form of intimidation, harassment, or harmful targeting of communities of individuals in Canada. We are seeking the public's attention, assistance, in reporting incidents of foreign interference by the government of India. Anyone who feels threatened online or in person should report the incidents to the local police. If someone is in immediate danger, please call 911. Individuals can also report to the RCMP National Security Information Network by calling 1-800-420-5805. As you can see, he was a little bit vague as to what the actual threat to Canadians were. He did mention that the Indian government posed a threat to certain Canadians and that they have conducted duty to warns. If they've conducted duty to warns, I, I wonder why they're doing this special announcement to the general Canadian population. They actually don't have a reason to. Now, I've been in the RCMP for several decades, as you know, and part of that time I was actually in strategic communications. And during my time in strategic communications, I, d I was involved in a few public safety announcements. They're rare because normally a person has to be charged before any names can be released to the public. 
However, when a threat to the general public exists, the police can take the extraordinary step of releasing a name of a person who was not charged. Maybe a person who's been released from a secure institution and poses a threat or something of that nature. Now, in this case, no names were mentioned. They just made an accusation against the Indian government. This is highly unusual, and I'm not sure what exact purpose it serves since they've already conducted several duty to warns. It's very curious to me why this was done, especially on Thanksgiving Day, because it really could have waited a day. Now, the audience was fairly sparse during this day. Most of the reporters had to phone it in via Zoom. This was a Zoom press conference. For all intents and purposes, there were a few people in the audience. So it begs the question, why? Why not wait a day? Now, the RCP did say they traveled to Singapore to meet with Indian officials and discuss this matter, but that their discussions were unsatisfactory. And that's why they're holding this press conference. Because of all the problems that Trudeau is going through with his caucus, this kind of feels like it's more of a diversion than anything. Trudeau claims that the High Commissioner for India was expelled by the Canadian government. Of course, the government of India said that they are recalling their High Commissioner and several other dis diplomats. Who's telling the truth? I don't know, but I can tell you that if Trudeau says something, it's usually a lie. So when I listened to the Vasi Capella interview of the Indian High Commissioner, I did find that some of the things he said didn't make a whole lot of sense, but some did. Although I question some of the things he said, I found him a little bit more believable than I find Trudeau on most days. Let's take a look at what he had to say, and we'll discuss it. If, High Commissioner, you have not done anything wrong, why are you not cooperating with Canadian authorities? Uh, so there are a couple of things. We needed to see some evidence uh, on the basis of which we can uh, converse with uh, our Canadian counterparts. Unfortunately, not a shred of evidence has been shared with us. Uh, any evidence which is shared has to be legally acceptable. Uh, we are a country of uh, rule of law, uh, and so is Canada. So therefore, anything which is acceptable in the Canadian Court of Law would largely also be acceptable in the Indian Court of Law, and therefore that evidence would work. Unfortunately, we have not got anything from any Canadian official which can lead us to a better uh, spot. As the RCMP, uh, our policing agency, has framed it very differently. I'm going to read exactly what they said about this issue in their statement. The Deputy Commissioner of Federal Policing, Mark Flynn, made attempts to meet with his Indian law enforcement counterparts to discuss violent extremism occurring in Canada and India and present evidence pertaining to agents of the government of India's involvement in serious criminal activity in Canada. These attempts were unsuccessful. Therefore, Deputy Commissioner Flynn met with officials of the government of India, along with the National National Security and Intelligence Advisor and Deputy Minister of Foreign Affairs David Morrison over the weekend. The RCMP's position and the federal government's position is they did attempt to show your government and your policing agencies the evidence that you require and you refuse to look at it. So the response to this is that it, they, uh, they wanted to leave for India on the 8th of October. They gave their completed application form only on the 8th of October. So visa needs to be affixed. For any delegation, government delegation to travel to another country, you need an agenda to go by. There was no agenda at all. So therefore, it was largely uh, uh, technical. I have to find the correct official on the Indian side so that the kind of things that I wanted to discuss for which I needed an agenda. There was no agenda shared with us. Agenda was shared uh, uh, at the last moment, I believe, even after the flight would have departed. So. It was nothing to do with it. I think it was pre-planned. They knew that the visa cannot be issued in half an hour to an hour. And therefore, they did it. I think it was absolutely politically motivated. Are you saying that that meeting couldn't take place, not because Indian officials didn't want to see the evidence, but because the proper procedures hadn't been followed? Not procedures. Proper uh, so visas were not there, and they needed to apply for a visa. There is a time which is taken to issue a visa. Between India and Canada, there is no visa-free agreement. So therefore, in general, I can tell you in general, for a government official from India to come to Canada, it would take at least a week to get the visa. Same thing happens with the Canadian officials. And 
they just gave it to us as fait accompli. That is one. So visa is one. Second is, what did they want to talk about? That was not shared at all. Isn't it clear, though, if the RCMP is coming to speak to their counterparts, and, and given what's occurred over so, the last year, that this would be involving the case at hand and the case is at hand? So, I see the most important case at hand from our point of view are the 26 extradition uh, uh, requests and so many other arrest requests. So, we would think that they are coming for that. They will hand over some of these people to us. It is not always that unless you clarify the agenda, we would exactly read your mind. So, so at some point, though, and, and I have questions about what you mentioned in, in a moment, but, but just sticking to the, the, what the RCMP and the federal government have put forward, at, at some point they would have communicated, we're coming to share with you evidence, evidence that you have asked for, including in this chair uh, you know, a number of months yes. ago, we are sharing with you evidence of very serious allegations that we have made involving yourself, your colleagues, and other agents of the government of India. I, I guess it's, it's confounding to me, and I imagine to people watching, why a, a visa or some, something of that nature would get in the way of India wanting to know what kind of evidence. Like, why would you not want to know all the evidence Canada has before it, unless you have something to hide? So we had been trying to get uh, the Canadian uh, officials, uh, the law and order officials, to talk to their Indian parts for the last one year. So there. Uh, uh, and, and we were the ones who went, have been asking for it. For last one year, there had been no movement. Now let's ask, why this movement now? So that was being forced on us without having an agenda, without knowing whom to meet. See, even in, like in any other large police organization or intelligence agencies, uh, we have NIA, which is National Investigating Agency, and they will have different officials dealing with diff different subjects. They don't deal with Canada as such. They deal with extradition, they deal with arrest, they deal with Interpol. So what is it that they wanted to talk about? Unless that agenda is clarified, how do I get my those people? So, But once so, it is, once it is. Once it is, it's, uh, we are always there. So, 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 so now you know what the allegations so are. They, what, have you met? Has anybody met with the Canadian side to get that evidence? So we are not here as our agencies. Canadian uh, officials in their... Uh, uh, interrogation or, or, or intelligence agency, we need to travel. So you travel like an official. For which, one, you give me an agenda. I will have to find out which official works on those agenda and then whether the official is available. Because like the Canadian officials keep traveling globally, Indian officials also keep traveling globally. So if they are not in my capital, you land up and then you say, you know, no one met me. I, I am a little perplexed that the kinds of reasons you're providing to not look at that evidence, you know, don't don't seem commensurate with the, the crime that essentially you're all being accused of. Like if someone accused me of being a person of interest in a murder, I'd want to know everything that they had on me, particularly if I had nothing to hide, which again allows me to circle back to the idea that you are leaving Canadians with the impression that your government does have something to hide. Absolutely not. And in fact, we have been asking for it for last one year, which RCMP has also said. Uh, and then, if you do not share with us the reason for your visit, how do we know? How, why are, and I, as I told you earlier, that my premier reason which will come to my mind, that probably you are going to talk about my extradition requests. Because to me, that is my core concern with Canada. Your concerns could be different from us. Fine, that's, that's the nature of uh, diplomacy. But then I have to know. The so no, but just to be clear, nobody said we want to meet because said, of A, B, and no, C. They just no. said we want to meet. No, not even meet. They said that we need visa to go to India. When it was asked to them, they said we want to meet our counterparts. Then when it was asked what will be the agenda for meeting, mm -hmm. because I'll have to pull out those officials if they are present in India. If they're not present, we'll have to uh, schedule it at some other time. Nothing came back. Uh, what came from Minister Jolie. Uh, the allegations that, that she makes are very serious, that you yourself are a person of interest in the murder of Hardeep Ninjar. Did you have anything to do with his murder? Nothing at all. No evidence presented. Politically motivated. So as you can see, he's saying that the RCMP applied for visas at the last moment or requested visas at the last moment. Visas take about a week to get, and they should have known that. So why did they wait until the last moment? And why didn't they share with him their agenda? 
Why didn't they share with him any of the information that they were going to discuss with their Indian counterparts? That is actually the High Commissioner's job to relay that information, to set up the meetings. He made a very good point. The RCMP didn't say who exactly they wanted to meet with. So how can they even be positive that that person was going to be in town when they went there? Why the last minute meeting? Why wasn't it planned better? It all seems very suspicious to me. As you can see, I'm, I'm not convinced that the High Commissioner is being 100% truthful here. However, as I said before, I do find him more truthful than Justin Trudeau, but that's not saying much. Now, the Indian press have been ruthless towards Justin Trudeau for, well, quite a long time now, well over a year, as a matter of fact, since all of this kind of blew up. But it seems like a lot of their suspicions are the same as our suspicions about Justin Trudeau's motivation and the timing of all of this. Let's take a look at one of the more popular news sites in India and hear what the presenter has to say. The gloves are off between India and Canada. It's an unprecedented escalation. New Delhi has downgraded its relationship with Canada. We have a high commissioner in Ottawa, but he, along with other diplomats, have been recalled. It's the latest chapter in a year-long standoff. Just a short while back, New Delhi summoned Canada's top diplomat in India. The high commissioner is not in the country, so the charge d'affaires stepped in. He was at the External Affairs Ministry for nearly 20 minutes, the Canadian charge d'affaires. By all accounts, it was a feisty talk. And look at the MEA statement that came out afterwards. India is withdrawing its High Commissioner from Canada. Listen to the reasons. And I'm quoting, it was underlined that in an atmosphere of extremism and violence, the Trudeau government's actions endangered the safety of diplomats. We have no faith in the current Canadian government's commitment to ensure their security. So India believes that its diplomats are not safe in Canada, and with good reason. Let me show you a video that Khalistani groups uploaded on their social media. burning an effigy of the High Commissioner of India to Canada. Now, there is context to what is happening here. On Sunday, Canada delivered a message to New Delhi. They said that Indian diplomats were persons of interest in a probe, including the High Commissioner. They were persons of interest, so they may be investigated. They did not say which probe, but it doesn't take a genius to figure out which. The Hardeep Singh Nijjar case, the killing of a Khalistani separatist in Surrey in Canada, Remember, Justin Trudeau had blamed India for the murder, and now it is probing, his government is probing the Indian High Commissioner as well. His name is Sanjay Kumar Verma. He is the top Indian diplomat in Canada, also the senior most in the government of India. High Commissioner Verma has 36 years of service under his belt. He's been posted in Japan, Italy, China, and Turkey. But India is now calling him back. We'll get to New Delhi's reactions in a bit, but first, listen to Canada's charge the affair. Canada has done what India has long been asking for. Canada has provided credible, irrefutable evidence of ties between agents of the government of India and a murder of a Canadian citizen on Canadian soil. Now it is time for India to live up to what it said it would do and look into those allegations. It is in the interest of both our countries and the, the peoples of our countries. To get to the bottom of this, Canada stands ready to cooperate with India. Canada says it has credible and irrefutable evidence. If that is the case, it raises some questions like, what is this piece of evidence? Why hasn't it been publicized? And why did Canada wait so long? These are questions that only the Trudeau government can answer. As for India, this is a strong message. You don't recall high commissioners unless the situation is dire, unless you want to downgrade the relationship. This is a new law for Canada. It tells you how Justin Trudeau has hurt this relationship. And it's not over yet. India has issued a warning to Canada. Let me quote again. It was also conveyed that India reserves the right to take further steps in response to the Trudeau government's support for extremism, 
violence and separatism against India. Like I said, it's not over yet. Canada could order a tit-for-tat move. India could escalate again. And this whole face-off could blow up further. But why now? Because this has been brewing for a while. So why these actions now? Well, Trudeau is currently in trouble. His Khalistani buddy, Jagmeet Singh, has dumped him. This is the internal politics of Canada. As you know, Jagmeet leads the NDP, or the New Democratic Party. That's, that's his political party. Justin Trudeau needed their support to stay in power. It's a coalition government. So right now, he does not have a majority in parliament because Jagmeet has dumped him. If elections are held now in Canada, Justin Trudeau would lose. Look at what the opinion polls say. Nearly 43% Canadians back the Conservative Party, that is the opposition. Only 22% support Justin Trudeau. What about Mr. Khalistan? Even worse, at 18%, that's his support base. So could this whole thing be a distraction, a typical foreign meddling bogey? Well, the Indian government has certainly hinted at that. We saw two statements from New Delhi today. We've told you about the latest one, but the first one is even more explosive. Listen to what it says. I'm quoting again. Prime Minister Trudeau's hostility to India has long been in evidence under criticism for turning a blind eye to foreign interference in Canadian politics. His government has deliberately brought in India an attempt to mitigate the damage. It is no coincidence that it takes place as Prime Minister Trudeau is to depose before a commission on foreign interference. And this is just a sneak peek. The full statement that the Ministry of External Affairs in India released today is quite critical. It recalls Justin Trudeau's 2018 visit to India. You may remember that one, the one where he dressed up like a wannabe Bollywood actor. It also talks about his comments on the farmers' protest in India. It even mentions his alliance with Jagmeet Singh. If you follow Indian reactions, Indian diplomatic reactions, you would know that this statement is quite unusual. Our statements never go into this kind of detail, nor do they delve into domestic politics of other countries. Which makes one thing quite clear. India has run out of patience with Justin Trudeau. Remember, he is the one who started this whole thing last year. Trudeau stood up in Canada's parliament and pointed fingers at India. That too for the killing of a Khalistani separatist, a man designated as a terrorist by New Delhi. What's more, he gave no evidence. You just heard the Canadian diplomat. He says, credible evidence has been passed on to India. But look at New Delhi's statement. I'm quoting again. The Canadian government has not shared a shred of evidence with the government of India, despite many requests from our side. Multiple extradition requests from the government of India in respect of terrorists and organized crime leaders living in Canada have been disregarded. Do you see the difference here? Canada says... Credible evidence was given. India says not a shred of evidence was shared. And this has only gone from bad to worse in the last few months. Trudeau has mishandled this whole situation. He could have opted for quiet diplomacy. But he chose to make a spectacle out of it, to put pressure on India. He also kept defending the separatist voices in Canada, whether it was threats against Indian diplomats or demands for, for a Khalistan referendum or even the glorification of an Indian Prime Minister's assassination. You don't expect this from friendly countries. But Justin Trudeau turned a blind eye to all of it. The path he chose inevitably led to this point. A downgrading of this important relationship. We certainly haven't heard the last of this squabble yet. We'll be tracking the updates closely for you. Now here's my question and my concerns. Why wasn't the Canadian government willing to extradite all of these terrorists? They had 26 dossiers, including the dossier of the man who was murdered in Surrey last year. And they had extradition requests for all those people. Had they extradited these terrorists, none of this would have happened. And before you say, well, they're citizens and we can't just extradite them. Well, we can. And the person who was murdered in Surrey, he wasn't always a Canadian. In fact, he entered Canada three times illegally before he was granted citizenship, which, in my view, he committed three crimes. He should not have been granted citizenship. And he was a terrorist before entering Canada. Canada should have known that and should not have granted him citizenship. They should have kicked him out of the country. And when presented with the dossier, 
they should have extradited him immediately, and that would have solved all of this. Canada has become a haven for criminals and terrorists, and Justin Trudeau seems to want to protect them. In my view, Justin Trudeau is more of a threat to Canada than the Indian government. But that's just my opinion. I'd love to know what you think. Put your comments down below. And while you're at it, please like this video, share with your friends and on social media. And if you haven't already, please subscribe to my channel and hit that bell notification so you never miss another video. Also, I invite you to join me on Thursday evenings at 6 p.m. Pacific time for my live stream, where you're invited to join in on the conversation. Finally, I teach the Canadian Firearm Safety Course, which is required for your firearms license, otherwise known as your PAL. If you'd like to take that course and you're on Vancouver Island or will be on Vancouver Island for any length of time, please look me up. I'd love to teach you that course. There are links in the description of this video where you can sign up for a course. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next video.